Greetings to my Western Civilization students. We're going to be beginning today with Ancient Egypt and we're going to just be really looking at the most ancient time um, before we really get into the era of the Greeks. So in terms of the chronology, we're looking at Mesopotamia, then Ancient Egypt, then Ancient Greece the previous slide and you'll see this is Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. The Egyptian civilization lasted until 30 BCE. That's 3,000 years of domination. In terms of its effect on the world as a whole, it's significant but not as significant as Mesopotamia or um, later we'll see with Greece and Rome mostly because the Egyptians stayed pretty much to themselves. They weren't really looking to conquer other lands. Um, one of my favorite facts about King Menes was he was supposedly killed by a hippopotamus. You can't say that by about a lot of our world leaders. There are three eras of ancient Egypt. The first is the Old Kingdom and this is 2686 BCE to 2125, so about 500 years. Then we have the Middle Kingdom, 2055 BCE to 1650 BCE, about 400 years. And then the New Kingdom, which is 1550 BCE to 1070 BCE, and again, around 500 years. Now, in between these time periods, we did have leadership, but it was a rivalry for leadership, so you didn't have a stable kingdom. Most kingdoms and civilizations, in order to really move forward in um, terms of progress, they need a stable leadership, and we're going to see this especially in the Roman era, when you could really tell the abilities of the Roman leaders by what was accomplished during their um, reign. Now, Egyptian civilization survived for so long because of the following reasons. First, it had that natural geographical barriers that protected it from invasion. So it was a much more st stable civilization than Mesopotamia. Um, most of the kings and queens were pretty strong and competent. That cannot be underestimated. You need a king and or a queen who really knows what they're doing. Also, they had excellent government bureaucracy, and that's how a government is organized. Um, religious influence supported the civilization, so religion went hand in hand with the leadership to kind of grow together. And then last but not least, they had great intellectual and cultural growth. So let's talk about the Old Kingdom first. First and foremost, the kings were called pharaohs, meaning great palace. They ruled based on the principles of Mahat. This was the idea that truth, justice, and harmony were fundamental rules of the universe. And even to today, you can kind of look around and see the countries that have a good justice system, that are not corrupt, that support all aspects of its population. And those are the societies that tend to do the best. Um, the pharaohs were seen as gods. And when a pharaoh died, he was essentially perceived to have gone up to take his place amongst the gods. And this is why the Great Pyramids were built. The pyramids were used for the dead kings as well as his family. Um, and again, you can kind of look at the original pyramids as that step, that giant triangle, as a way of um, almost like a staircase to heaven. A writing emerged at the beginning of the Old Kingdom, and it's called hieroglyphics, meaning sacred writings, and you'll see an example of that on the left-hand side. The Middle Kingdom, from 2055 BCE to 1650 BCE, um, at this point, the pharaohs were seen as the shepherds of their people. People were sheep, the pharaohs were shepherds and they were responsible for building public buildings and to provide for the population. Um, one of the really fascinating aspects of ancient Egypt is how many of their great temples and their um, you know, pyramids have survived three, 
for 5,000 years. And when you go to Egypt, although I don't recommend going right now, um, you can tour all these and it's just remarkable to be walking amongst these buildings that are literally five, 6,000 years old. Um, today, Egypt is in the middle of a political battle. Um, they have overthrown the last two presidents and now the military is essentially running the country. So it's really not a good time to book your trip to the Nile. Then we have the New Kingdom. And this is when Egypt became a much more militaristic perspective. This is when they went to go conquer other people. And this is when you go conquer other people, they then say, hey, we should turn around and conquer you. And this is where you see a lot of money being spent on uh, the military, the defense, the systems for weaponry, and you'll see some of the more popular weapons over here. You have the bow and arrow, you have the shield, you have a short spear, you have this sickle-shaped knife, and they were moving into Africa because Egypt is in North Africa, so all they had to do was go south, or they could go uh, north into parts of Europe and then to the Middle East on the eastern side. Let's talk about some of the pharaohs. King Tut is the most famous. Um, his remains and his possessions have toured the country a few different times in terms of uh, all of his cool stuff that he had. Lots of gold. Now, what you're going to see here at these pictures, this was his actual tomb where he his body was laid. This is what his body looks like in the middle here. Um, he was mummified, which involves essentially taking out all the liquids from your body, including your brain. Uh, one of the cool things they did when they were um, mummifying people is that they would put a large knitting needle type thing into the corpse's nose up into their brain and literally scramble the brain until it became liquefied and then they used a hook to pull the brain matter out. So essentially what you're seeing is the um, flesh and skeleton but anything of, of, of value was essentially taken out because then it would rot and it would smell and it would cause all kinds of disintegration issues. Um, this is a uh, representation that was created during Tut's lifetime. This is what they think his face looked like and this is what they used as his sarcophagus. That's what they actually covered him with. Now as I mentioned the Egyptian religion was very important and they've got some great stories. So first and foremost, we have Ray, the sun god. He had the human body, but the head of a falcon. Then you had Osiris, the river god. And think about it, the Nile River is where they got their food. So of course the river god and the sun god would be two of the most important gods in their pantheon. Um, most civilizations at this time period where polytheistic had multiple gods, each god representing a certain aspect of their civilization that was important for them. So here's the story of Osiris because it's one of the better ones and Osiris is here over here on the right. His brother Set murdered him and if you think about the um, Old Testament in the Bible you know you have the Cain and Abel story so again what you're looking at is some uh, repetition from religion to religion. Osiris's wife Isis um, brought him back to life and Osiris then became a symbol of resurrection and the judge of the dead. And this is why mummies house the remains of kings with all their belongings. They believe that their devotion to Is Osiris would guarantee them new life. Isis over here on the left and for those of you who are comic book people you'll know that Isis is who Wonder Woman uh, got her powers from. If you're not a comic book person I apologize for bringing that up. Um, so Isis is the land goddess and again very important in terms of fertility. She's the wife of Osiris. Then we have Set. He's the god of chaos and violence and that's Set over here with um, the very charming red, kind of an armadillo head. 
When Set killed Osiris, he chopped him into fourteen pieces, tossing them into the Nile. Isis gathered the pieces and restored Osiris to life. Um, as a consequence, she came to represent new life or the new crop each growing season. So let's look at ancient Egyptian family life. And these are actual representations that archaeologists have discovered. So you'll see that the children are literally miniature versions of their parents. And this is something that you'll see throughout the first uh, 4,000 years of history, is that children were seen as miniature adults, not necessarily as children. You don't see children as a particular group um, until the Age of Enlightenment in the 1700s. So um, for most artistic representations, children are mini versions of their um, parents or the adults. So marriage was monogamous, meaning you couldn't have more than one wife. But in Egypt, a man could have more than one wife if his first wife could not have children. Because again, remember, one of the most important aspects for civilization is the ability to carry on civilization and you needed to have multiple children in order to carry on to the next generation. Keeping in mind also that there was a, about a 50% likelihood that your child would die before reaching adulthood. Pharaohs had harems, but his first wife was the queen, so it was good to be the queen. Women in ancient Egypt had considerable power, and this was unusual. Um, at the time. They were in charge of their household, they educated their children, they were able to hold property and inherit from their families. Keeping in mind that up until the 20th century most women did not have this in the rest of the world. So that's a pretty shocking idea. Um, also keeping in mind that in certain countries today, for example Saudi Arabia, women are not allowed to engage in business, they're not allowed to drive, they're not allowed to hold property, um, they're not even allowed really to leave their houses without a male escort. So we're talking about a civilization that was so far ahead of its time in how it treated women. Additionally, women um, divorce was allowed and women were compensated. Again, shockingly unique in terms of the historical context. Um, if a woman cheated on her husband, she would have her nose cut off or be burned at the stake. So things weren't altogether perfect for women, but they were certainly much better than um, in many other of the civilizations and even today in some countries. Notice in the picture that you'll see up here on the right, there is another child, multiple children, and again, they are miniature versions of the adults. Now, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that there were in fact female pharaohs, and we don't realize this necessarily because they were still referred to by male pronouns and this rhetorical strategy has a twofold effect. One, it allowed um, the patriarchy or the male concept to maintain the power and second, you really had to go back into history to see and understand that there were women who led a civilization. And as a consequence to this, and keeping in mind that women in the United States did not get the right to vote till the 1920s. So women for a long time were subjugated, and you can look back 4,000 years and you can see that in Egypt, women were actually seen in some measure, if not in all measures, as equal. So those are three of our more famous female pharaohs. So now we've seen Egypt doing a, um, pretty amazing civilization, so what caused it to decline? And remember when I said, once you get involved in the military attempt to get more land or more money or more power, that's when other countries look at you with suspicion and they start to attack you, and this is exactly what happened. Around 1000 BCE, the empire started to fall apart. However, Egypt continued to exist as a fairly important entity until it was conquered totally by the Persians around 580 BCE. You're going to notice when we start, start talking about ancient Egypt that the Persians were pretty pesky um, soldiers. They were the ones who really caused a lot of the um, problems for the Egyptians and the Greeks back in this era. 
and we don't really know too much about them um, because they are more Eastern than Western. But uh, if you've seen the movie 300, um, those are the folks that the Greeks, the Spartans were fighting, were the Persians. Um, today, Persia is still a country, although we call it Iran. But if you go out to California, most Iranians will still call themselves Persians. And there's a fairly large population of Persians out in California. Then the Roman Empire dominated the political world of Egypt in the first century BCE. Remember Cleopatra? Well, Cleopatra shows up around this time period and she does battle with the Roman um, Empire Emperor Augustus and uh, she dies. Actually, she kills herself with the bite of a snake or what we call an asp. So um, in terms of what we're looking at historically, Egypt is fairly important in terms of developing architecture, developing engineering, developing the sense of bureaucracy for a government, but it is definitely in the shadow of um, our ancient Roman Empire um, stories. So.